Well, Kate, thanks for joining us to talk about emerging trends in privacy and data. And uh, it's, it's a complicated topic at times, particularly when we factor in cyber. Um, one of the things I think is helpful is really trying to define privacy. And, and from your perspective, when we talk about privacy, what do we really mean? Yeah, I mean, I think privacy probably means different things to different people and in different contexts. But as a general matter in the U.S., I think privacy is the principle that individuals have a right to be free from unreasonable and unexpected intrusions into their personal and private lives and in, lives, and in particular, um, intrusive and unreasonable or unexpected collection use or processing of personal data, um, all, all manner of personal data. Got it. And, and how do you see that as being different when we talk about data in a broader sense? Yeah, I mean, data is certainly a big part of privacy. Uh, and of course, a key focus of privacy laws and regulations is personal data. Um, most privacy laws, in fact, right, focus on the, um, you know, control of personal data, controlling how businesses collect, use, process, and protect personal data, um, and empowering consumers with rights over their personal data uh, to give them more sort of control and choice over how their data is used. Uh, but data, on the other hand, is, you know, broader than just privacy and personal data, right? I mean, all personal data is data, but not all data is personal data. Um, and certainly, you know, while most privacy laws and regulations focus on personal data, um, certainly, you know, there are other types of data that aren't personal data that have just as much value and can, you know, lead to just as much business risk. If there's a loss um, of availability or a breach of confidentiality. So I think, you know, data, data is a broader kind of concept um, than privacy and personal data. Yeah, and look, I think when you look at it, you, you can sort of look at the access issues, right? And we're seeing that a lot now with AI and, and scraping. Yeah. And, and do you have the lawful right to, to get the data, even if it's not personal? You have a rights issue around IP, which is related, but a little different. Obviously, exactly. the privacy issue you talked about, um, whether there's a permissible purpose, and we see that in the U.S. with, with you know, the more sectoral approach, like with FICRA, um, processing mm -hmm. data is permitted for some reasons and not others. And then... Right. You know, I think one of the more interesting ones that we're seeing play out is the automation point, right? We've, you and I have dealt with automated processing in some form for a long time, but that's different than a lot of the AI issues that our AI team deals with when they're looking at the algorithm itself exactly. or they're looking at, you know, when the algorithm, you know, the process can actually think for itself. That's, that's not a privacy issue as much as it's an AI issue. And so, right. you know, I think that's how we try to differentiate these really kind of weird issues around data. But I, I think you're right. I mean, the, the data issues are much broader. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, not all, you know, data is broad. Personal data is a subset of that. Um, you know, on the same yeah. hand, I think to, to the point you were making, right, um, not all intrusions or unfairness um, relates to uh, exploitation of personal data, right? To your point, AI raises additional issues, right? And it's kind of tied in with data, too, right? Um, the data the algorithms rely on, but also the underlying algorithms, right? And so uh, it's, all, it's all related, but in privacy, I think, and personal data are kind of just one component of that. Yep. No, that's exactly right. And then we have cyber and how it's it's a related but different issue. How do you sort of conceptualize cyber versus privacy and how do we tie them together? Yeah, I mean, some people call privacy and cyber two sides of the same coin. I think they're just, I think they're more complementary and related concepts, right? So I think of privacy as control over personal information. How can it be used? How can it be disclosed? How long can it be kept, you know? what you know what is reasonable you know in terms of processing of personal data whereas i think cyber focuses on um protecting data including personal data right um you know ensuring the confidentiality security and integrity of data and also not just data but the underlying infrastructure and systems that we rely on to kind of manage and make sure data is available you know process data right so um a cyber incident could involve personal data or it might not, right? Um, it could just, you know, lead to the unavailability, unavailability of key information networks and, you know, your inability to operate your business, right? Which is a, a really significant risk and can lead to huge losses, um, but not because of personal data per se, right? Right, exactly. 
Um, and, and look, that we've seen the rise of cyber over the last 10 years and um, in a meaningful way. And what we've now seen is a lot of states step in and, and pass, uh, at least in their state, a comprehensive privacy law. How have you seen that impact what clients are doing and what, what do you see the laws as attempting to regulate? Yeah, I mean, I think all of the, you know, comprehensive privacy laws in the U.S., I think we're up to 12 now. Um, they focus on personal data, right? They place obligations and restrictions on the collection, use, retention of personal data uh, onto businesses who collect it. Um, and they give, they empower individuals with certain rights, rights that look a lot like GDPR rights, um, but are, you know, a little bit different, right? Um, most of these state privacy laws focus on the more uh, traditional U.S. concept of consumer too, right? Um, somebody acting in a, in a personal or um, uh, household or family context, right? Whereas, we, you know, the outlier to that is the CCPA, obviously, California. If there is an outlier, it's almost always California, um, you know, defines consumer as just any resident of California. So that brings and employees and business to business relationship data and business to business lead gen data, right? So California is a little broader than these other laws. Um, the laws also um, kind of concept conceptualize this, this definition of sensitive personal information, which I think is a combination of EU sensitive personal information or special categories data and sort of the US data breach personal information, right? All rolled into one category of higher risk data with additional obligations that uh, attach to it under privacy laws. Um, yep. And then I think beyond the comprehensive privacy laws, there's also been a, num uh, an, a, a few notable state privacy laws too, um, uh, focusing on consumer health data and children's data. I think the most significant of these is the Washington My Health My Data Act which takes effect um, beginning in March of next year and really adopts a very broad definition of consumer health data. So, um, you know, it, in, it includes, for just for example, also all biometric data, which you don't tend to think of as health data per se, we think of it as identifying data, you know, sensitive identifiers, right? But biometric data is by definition consumer health data under the Washington um, my health, my data law, as is, you know, measurements from your fitness tracker and, you know, other sorts of physical measurements of your body. Um, uh, so it's pretty broad and sweeping and it goes kind of beyond the traditional definition of consumer health data. It also gets at things like, you know, retail purchase data. Have you bought a pregnancy test? Do you buy condoms, right? Like, are you of childbearing age? Like, these things are all considered sensitive personal information under the law. And so I think it's gonna have some really sweeping applications that uh, I think companies aren't fully aware of yet. Yeah. No, I think you're right. And I think that with that compliance de deadline looming, it's gonna make it really interesting for a lot of companies. And I, I think that's a perfect example of, you know, something we hear in the space a lot is, well, our company's GDPR compliant and that should be, you know, th that sort of means we're compliant with all these other US state laws. I mean, what's What's your thought on that? Yeah, I mean, look, the short answer is being GDPR compliant and also, you know, I one of my pet peeves is saying I'm GDPR compliant because I think GDPR compliance is also this ongoing um, obligation, right? Like it's not static, right? So I always caution, you know, clients, don't say you're GDPR compliant, say you have a great GDPR compliance program, for example, including, right? Um, that's a little bit lawyerly, but also I just think practically GDPR requires a lot. But at the same time, if you have a great, very strong GDPR compliance program, it's a good foundation for you know privacy compliance more broadly, but it's not enough in and of itself. And being GDPR compliant is not does not make you privacy compliant, you know, from a US privacy law perspective. So yeah. What are we seeing uh, regulators do? We've seen a lot of regulatory activity. Um, on the cyber side, but more importantly, I think on the privacy side, we're seeing an uptick as well. What have you been seeing? Yeah, you know, I think a lot of what we've been seeing is um, what I think of as kind of the low hanging fruit too, right? The easy, easy to tell stuff, what you can discern by going to a company's website, looking at their privacy policy, you know, do they have tracking cookies? Anybody can tell. If so, are they recognizing, you know, global privacy control signals? Do they have an opt out? 
Do they have the right CCPA? Do not sell links in the footer. Um, you know, uh, do they offer a loyalty program? And if so, do they have the right financial incentives language and are they getting the right level of consent for that? Um, you know, are they making it too hard to exercise your privacy rights? Those kinds of things that are super easy to test is where I think we've seen a lot of the focus and it makes kind of makes sense too, right? It's, uh, it's easy enough, right? Yep. So um, I think that'll change. Uh, you know, I think we'll start to see um, what I expect we're going to start to see some sort of ex exemplar cases on um, this whole concept of um, dark patterns, which is in all of these laws, right? More broadly than just like exercising your rights or submitting a request, but you know, this idea that you can sort of encourage people to make the less privacy protective um, choice by either making it harder to make a privacy protective choice or kind of being confusing or overemphasizing what the choice you want consumers to make as opposed to letting them choose between two equally presented options. And Lord knows we've seen the uh, plaintiff's lawyers go after a lot yeah. of those similar cases too, particularly with like yeah. the chats, chat function and the wiretap claims and the cookies. And then we've seen a lot of activity there and I don't think that's going to go away anytime soon. No, certainly not. I mean, and it's still early enough that we don't have, you know, enough helpful, I think, you know, binding court decisions that kind of help us dispose of some of these. But you're right. I mean, aside from the, you know, the low hanging fruit from a regulatory perspective, tracking, you know, um, pixel related tracking, as you say, chatbot session replay, and also starting to see um, some claims around like B2B um, demand generation software, right? There's a lot of software out there that if I go and visit a business's website, um, they look at my IP address, they figure out what company that belongs to, and then they append data to that um, information. We're seeing claims around that, which is really interesting to me um, because that's that's relatively new um, in, the, in the U.S. space, at least, you know, seeing these types of claims. So you're absolutely right. There's this huge volume of that right now. And what are some best practices companies can think about as these laws continue to evolve so quickly? Yeah, well, I think... Certainly, it's really difficult right now to take sort of a state by state or even a country by country, region by region approach to privacy compliance. Things are changing too quickly. You know, pri privacy involves personal data. Personal data is a subset of data, you know. So, you know, these things are all kind of interrelated. And I think if you focus too narrowly on privacy compliance, you know, as a starting point, um, and you know, react to all these new privacy laws, you're being really inefficient probably, and it's really hard to sustain. So I, I tend to think it's better to kind of think of this as a part of you know, an overall data governance program and strategy that includes a, you know, privacy, it includes cyber, you know, it, it kind of rolls that all into one. And I think it starts with, um, or includes at least, you know, involvement of key executive leadership too, right? I think it's not enough to have a privacy compliance team saying the law says this, therefore we need to do that, right? You need to set the strategy and the risk tolerance kind of at the top and you need the key stakeholders to be involved and in sort of buying in and supporting and helping to set the strategy so that you can decide what's your risk tolerance and from there, what's the privacy you know, framework that you want to set your controls to so that you can assess your current practices, you know, implement remediations, and then, you know, um, look at new laws against your existing program, right? I think we kind of have to think of it from that perspective or else you're just constantly pivoting kind of from one thing to another, playing whack-a-mole and, you know, getting lost in the minutia of it and, and, and not getting kind of the support you need as a privacy professional, you need buy-in, you need budget, and you need resources. And so I think the more effective way to do that is, at, you know, to think of it as, as you know, I say, it's part of an overall data governance um, program. No, I think you're right. And look, it's it's hard to keep chasing the law and the law is constantly changing, to your point, right? It's, it's just, it's hard for any program to sustain that kind of change. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Okay, thanks for joining us today. I really appreciate your insights. Can I say two more things? Absolutely. So I was thinking about this before our call, um, and 
I was thinking about what are some of these out, you know, we talk about these state privacy laws, we talked about that a couple of questions ago and sort of how they're, how they're alike in a lot of ways, but there are definitely some outliers too that I think are worth mentioning just really quickly um, because I don't, there's not a lot of attention I think being paid yep. to them. One is California law has some really, really specific requirements on how you have to flow down consumer rights requests to your service providers and your third parties, deletion requests, opt out requests, other types of requests correction requests. Um, and it's, it's as with all things CCPA, they're kind of overly granular, right? Um, another, another thing I think that is worth mentioning is, you know, the California Privacy Act came in, it was passed without a lot of fanfare. And then, you know, everybody was focusing on the CCPA regulations with the Colorado Attorney General passed and finalized and they've taken effect, you know, implementing regulations under the CPA. There's some really interesting kind of specific requirements in there that go well beyond what the law says. Um, and I, I'll just call out a couple of them really quickly. One is they've got very granular consent obligations. So if you need to get consent, the law says exactly what you need to address in order to get informed consent and to make it valid. If, if you're getting consent to sell or share data, you have to list every entity to whom you're selling or sharing that data. Um, and it also has rules around when consent expires. So when you need to renew consent or when it expires. So it's pretty granular. And also worth um, uh, mentioning that the regs actually have some pretty granular privacy notice requirements too. So very similar to the CCPA, though not quite as specific. So um, if you haven't looked at these, these are definitely worth a read. No, it sounds like it. And companies need to be aware of that because obviously there will be enforcement behind it for sure. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you, Kate. I really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, absolutely. Bye, Andy.